Good afternoon, mm -hmm. Excellencies, honored guests, Dutch friends, <clears throat> participants, colleagues, and most of all, new students. Welcome to UNESCO IHG for the opening of the academic year 2016 and Alumni Day. Dear new students, this is the start of a new exciting episode of your life. You share this special moment with your fellow students sitting all around you from all over the world. For the next hour, we have prepared a diverse program to welcome and inspire you and uh, make sure that you enjoy the next 18 months ahead. We welcome you to the IG panel. Now I would like to invite our rector, Dr. Fitz Halsworth, to do the honors and open the program. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor, Ambassadors, Excellencies, representatives of the Dutch government, members of the governing board, professors, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to say a very special and warm welcome to the Vice Rector of TU Delft, Peter Verinka, it is a great honor that you are here and it is a great expression of working close together TU Delft and UNESCO IHE. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Dear new students, today is a special day, especially for you. And uh, it's also a special day for the Institute, for all staff in the Institute, for the professors, for the uh, staff which supported you when you came in. And I think this special day is important that we find a kind of ceremony to make it special. Since you arrived at UNESCO IHE, you have met your fellow students from all parts of the world. And you have now an amazing opportunity to learn from each other and uh, to really use the opportunities in this institute to learn from our academic staff, but also from each other. Share knowledge. And what is quite, expe uh, what is quite important not just sharing knowledge. I think if I remember earlier openings and uh, discussions with uh, new students, you have a lot of stories to share, to make clear where you are coming from, what are the problems in your home country, why are you here, and sometimes it's not simply uh, scientific, Thing, it is something where you stand behind as a person, and I think this is also important. Take advantage of the fact that the Institute deals with all aspects of water in a cross cutting, interdisciplinary approach. It's not simply looking at wastewater pipes or water supply pipes. It's looking beyond also what is the government system these pipes are working in. And last but not least, it's also important, and this is one of the reasons why you are here, that no technology, the technology could be advanced is much, will work without well-educated and well-trained persons. And this is something what is important uh, to see. 
160 new students from 61 countries. We all welcome you warmly and we hope that your experience is life-changing. And I would like to quote our new alumni award person, Professor Seifeld from uh, Sudan. He said to me a few months ago when I met him in Paris in the UNESCO headquarters, He's an alumni of this institute. He always uh, uh, kept contact with us. He said, I was at a lot of places around the world, but this institute changed my life. And I think this is something what uh, is important to get from an experienced and senior person. You know from your own country, but also from reading about it, that water-related challenges all over the, over the world are in the news every day. People are recognizing how important water is. And uh, I think it's quite important to see that water connects. Water connects water-related sectors. Water connects with agriculture. Water connects with hydropower. Water connects with ecosystems. Water also connects people in transboundary river basins. And I think this is important to see that water is, in one or the other case, a sort of conflict, but much more important is to recognize that water is a catalyst for cooperation. And this is something we should keep in mind the time you're here. Our staff, your fellow students, the PhD fellows will support you throughout the 18 months. And do not hesitate to ask if you need help. But it should be also clear that these 18 months are a challenge in various directions. It's on one hand side an intellectual challenge because you are starting a new exercise. It's secondly a multicultural challenge for you. It's on one hand side that you're together with fellow students from 61 countries, but you are also challenged by the Dutch culture you are now in for 18 months. And uh, I think this is also really important to see. And uh, I think it's quite important to uh, also uh, be open to it. You arrived over the weekend and I quickly came in uh, Sunday late evening when still in the Institute a lot of colleagues had been really busy and, uh, and tried to get you to the hostel, to your, uh, to your flats. I would like to use this opportunity to thank all staff and I explicitly like to mention at this point the support staff in student affairs, in uh, all the parts where, the, where uh, yeah, very often a kind of invisible hands are active and uh, I think it was, it would have been not possible to give you such a welcome without the dedication and commitment of our staff. But also, fellow students and PhD fellows had been engaged and made sure that you had been properly picked up at the airport, that you can, that you could have 
a first good experience in taking the train in the Netherlands from Schiphol to Delft. And I think what is also something what I would like to mention, what I said before, be open if it comes to Dutch culture. I am very pleased that um, the uh, coordinators and the volunteers of the program meet the Dutch are amongst us because I think this is a program where you cannot simply have a look from outside what is happening in the Netherlands. You get a kind of insight if you uh, tie up with the uh, families here in Delft how a Dutch family is going to do things, how they are used to have dinner or lunch, how they are used to celebrate certain, uh, certain events during the year and probably uh, you also have the chance to, uh, to join and to visit next year the King's Day where you can see how in this country all people are really committed and dedicated to, uh, to celebrate this day. Welcome. And water is a very special issue. And you know from your own country, but also from TV or from the press, that Refugees, migration is an important to all the aspects they are triggering this process. And therefore, I feel very honored and very pleased that for the opening of this academic year, Caroline Sikraf accepted to be our keynote speaker. And for sure, the theme she is talking about is a bit provocative, but the theme also makes clear that environmental degradation, water scarcity, degradation of water quality are important reasons for people to decide to leave their country. Therefore, a quick insight into your CV. Caroline Sikraf is Deputy Director of the Hugo Observatory at the University of Liège. This is worldwide the first scientific research center working or dedicated to the study of environmental triggered migration. And I think the reason why we decided to ask you to come is that we would like to put what we are doing in this institute in a really broader overall context and make sure that you see that in Europe this issue is discussed and, um, and, uh, and researched in a really serious and dedicated way. I don't like to go through a long list of your CV, Caroline. It's a great honor that you are here and you have the floor now. Please. So, and thank you for having me, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's a really a privilege to open this academic year here in Delft. I myself did my master's degree in the Netherlands, uh, so it's my pleasure to greet you as you also embark on yours. 
As a specialist in coastal and deltaic population movements uh, in the developing world, I've been asked to speak to you about environmental migration, but especially about the relationship between water and migration. In fact, when you, whether you recognize it or not, uh, water invades much of the ways we think and discuss all kinds of migration. Here in Europe, but also across the Western world, it is the language of water that we call upon to describe migration. We rather innocuously speak of migration flows, the tide of migration, migration waves, migrations flood our shores. The title of one Bloomberg article, Europe's wave of migration brought too many men. Another a Huffington Post article, why the flood of refugees will not stop whatever happens in Syria. From the Economist, simply rising tide to refer to uh, migrants in Greece. The Wall Street Journal uh, manages a quite insistent use of water wording in the title, Tide of Migrants Pours into Austria and Germany. Thousands are still streaming across Hungary's border. Now I raise this point of water language not because it's coincidental that we're here at the uh, Institute for Water Education, but because these metaphors are powerful in the way that they shape our world views on migration. There is, in my opinion, a rather dangerous messaging underlying these analogies and metaphors, even when it is unintentional. After all, how does one stop water? How does one stop a tide, a flood, or a wave? Liquid is, in a way, uncontrollable, unquantifiable entity that slips through our fingers. How can we hold back such a force of nature. And the uncontrollable is something fearsome and unmanageable, and a security concern. Even more than that, this mass collective framing of, of migration in waves or tides or floods, it dehumanizes and homogenizes and anonymizes the very people, the person uh, that experiences migration. Individual experiences, motivations, their successes, their obstacles, their challenges, lose their value and the recognition and favor of the anonymous whole. But water is much more than a loose metaphor with which we articulate fears and insecurities about mass migration to Europe or anywhere else for that matter. The relationship between water and migration is much more tangible than that. Water is at the heart of so many population movements, and that's today, not just in the future, in a future world of climate change. And it's about primarily this discourse we embark on, and the public fears and media attention is about these so-called climate refugees and international intercontinental migration from developing countries to Europe. But most people, forced to varying degrees to leave their homes because of water issues, will stay within national boundaries. Internal environmental migration far outweighs international movements. And when the impacts of climate change or environmental degradation more broadly, such as sea level rise or coastal erosion, uh, drought, do drive people across national borders, these people primarily stay within their regions of origin. West Africa, for example, where I work, is the most mobile region in the world, far more mobile than the Schengen area. The Senegalese fishermen that I work with rarely board ships bound for the Canary Islands or traverse North Africa in order to get to Europe. They rather move to neighboring Mauritania, seeking a better life for them and their families. For many people from developing countries, especially those whose livelihoods are dependent on natural resources, including water, such as the 60% of Africans for whom agriculture is a way of life in itself, water is at the heart of their mobility, and not always in a problematic sense. Uh, the coastal fishermen of whom I spoke uh, have built an entire culture around the sea and migration historically. As one man quite simply stated, the fish migrate, and so must we. But water can also be a source of destruction and displacement and involuntary movement. Over the past five to six years, an average of 26 million people are displaced 
annually within national borders by natural disasters. And that's one every second. And it's actually, in 2015, twice as many people were newly displaced by natural disasters as conflict. According to the International Displacement Monitoring Center, multiple typhoons having struck Philippines in 2015, three of the strongest storms combined to displace two million people. Floods, landslides, and the impact of Cyclone Komen displaced more than 1.6 million people in Myanmar. However, water-based or related sudden onset disasters and involuntary migration it causes are just one among a series of relationships between water, the natural environment, and human migration. Disasters can also be progressive and gradual, slowly making livelihoods unsustainable and land uninhabitable. While flooding and storms cause massive displacement globally each year, the dynamics and impacts of displacement and migration associated with slow onset disasters uh, are much more difficult to quantify and poorly documented. We can count, at least to some extent, the people who are directly displaced from their homes by flooding. How does one count the number of people who migrate, at least partially, because of diminishing or deteriorating water resources? Droughts and desertification do not strike suddenly, but slowly creep into the lives of those affected, reducing their ability to produce crops, to graze cattle or other herds, to cook, to fish. Although drought-driven migration in, in Ethiopia is perhaps one of the most iconic examples of such a migration, many migrations induced by slow-onset environmental changes like drought and coastal erosion or the depletion of fish stocks become invisible to us. The salinization of soil and the decrease in rainfall in the Mekong Delta, from where I just returned, is slowly eroding rural livelihoods of rice farmers, but their subsequent migrations, or the rural to urban migration of their children <coughs> to Ho Chi Minh City, for example, is rarely understood as environmental migration. These people are strictly economic or labor migrants. Complex problems placed into simple, digestible boxes. And the complexity is exacerbated when we think about why someone becomes an environmental migrator, and others do not. First of all, we know well that a flood or a drought does not have the same impacts everywhere. A flood in Malawi can have hugely disastrous impacts on displacement and migration, while it may be only a blip on the radar in the UK. Why is that? A hazard event does not become a disaster without vulnerability. The political, economic, social, and demographic variables are inseparable from the environmental hazards themselves or the water resources themselves. They together combine to create vulnerable populations who are then subject to this involuntary migration, even if it is a preemptive or apparently a choice. Adaptation and mitigation technologies and strategies will be essential in diminishing this vulnerability and increasing resilience. And this is where most national and international policymakers are concerned, implementing plans and communities of origin that will stop this dreaded migration. What technologies might hold back the sea from claiming coastal homes in Senegal? What farming techniques can cope with flooding and monsoons in Bangladesh? How can we prevent environmental migration? These innovative technologies are desperately wanted and needed to protect potential and currently displaced people. In my work uh, in Senegal, there's often talk and rumors of, of the Dutch experts at holding back the sea, coming to their rescue, protecting the land and homes they had left. In the Mekong, people send children to school specifically to learn aquaculture, techniques and ways of managing their degrading environment and livelihoods. But one word of caution. When we talk about water and migration, let us not only think about how you, through your studies, can stop migration. Let us not fall back on the idea that migration is inherently bad. Many of us here are migrants. A failure to adapt to a changing environment is the way we often think of environmental migration. But migration is adaptation. 
When well managed and well informed, it offers socioeconomic opportunities for migrants, for their destination areas, and for the areas of origin. Remittances are one great example. Financial remittances generated by migrants often decrease the dependence people have on their natural resources. Social remittances, including the transfer of skills and ideas and knowledge, such as you might one day, I hope, bring back to your countries for those of you coming from fragile environments, can be hugely helpful in adaptation. Why this matters is because if we only talk about stopping migration, we forget what happens when people cannot move. So-called climate refugees are not the only threat. There is also such a thing as involuntary immobility. When people can become trapped in flood risk zones or drought prone areas. And this is because when we have environmental degradation, whether it's a lack of water, an abundance of water, or the contamination of water, the impacts on people's financial resources often mean people cannot migrate. They simply cannot afford to. So they become trapped in a danger of health ailments, of malnutrition, increasing poverty and vulnerability, and ultimately of death. So let us stop talking about solving environmental migration by ending it. Let us start to create adaptation and mitigation technologies and plans that enable the choice to stay, but also the choice to leave. In order uh, to do that, we need young people, bright minds, to forge a world through technology, innovation, dedication, and ambition in which water and migration is not the privilege of the few and the downfall of the many. So I wish you luck in your studies, and I welcome you to death. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you, you put what our students intend to do in a bigger framework. And I think uh, it is uh, also, you gave us a lot of fruit for thoughts, which goes beyond what we can read every day in our newspapers and what we can see every day in TV. And I very much thank you for your uh, opening keynote speech. Thank you very much. Now I would like to ask your attention for a special, special performance. Mr. Josias Ritter is an IT alumnus. Only one month ago, he received his diploma as Master of Science in Flood Risk Management, and currently he is um, participating in an advanced class for continuing research on his master thesis topic. He is going to sing for us and play the guitar uh, and sing his own version of the song He Sleeps Alone, originally by the band called Two Doors Cinema Club. You'll see it. Oh, 
Cause we're always fast asleep Cause it is so hard not to believe What we will never know So hold, hold Your Excellencies, dear guests, dear students, dear colleagues, and dear friends, it's also my pleasure to uh, have you here at the opening of the academic year 2016-2017. In the next part of the program, we will be uh, addressing two more uh, events, I would say, very important uh, events. First, um, the chair of the Student Association Board will address and welcome the, uh, the new students, the new members of our UNESCO <coughs> IHC family. The Student Association Board has four members and the chair will be addressing you, but um, let me also take the opportunity to speak shortly about the other members. The chair is uh, Mr. Nibu Chidubere, but we also have the vice chair, Mr. Santosh Garakali Sidaya from India, our treasurer, Mr. Sabuba Gupta from India, our secretary, Mr. David Stephen Ocheno Omolo from Kenya, and as I mentioned, uh, lead, led by the, by the chair of the, uh, of the board. The work of the board is all about connecting uh, the student with the institute. Not only on matters of study, but also on matters of well-being. And I think Fritz already mentioned uh, the example of what we uh, had as a major endeavor last week, the arrival of you to the Netherlands. And um, I would like to underline uh, the support that was given uh, and organized through the uh, Student Association Board for having this all uh, in, in, in good order and timely arranged under the leadership and coordination of especially also Vice Chair uh, Santos. So thank you all for that. Uh, second, we are also uh, celebrating this year the uh, Alumni Day and more than 15,000 alumni have preceded you. More than 15,000, I repeat, have preceded you as an alumnus of the uh, wonderful institute. So when you are here, you will be here not just among a fellow student for another 18 months, but you were here also connecting for life with a 
very large community. And the importance of this network is amply demonstrated by um, our special guest and winner of the uh, Alumni Award, who will also be speaking a little bit later in the uh, program. But for now, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Niburu uh, Chiribere, Chairman of the uh, Student Association Board, to come to the stage and address our students. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm from Nigeria. I know he missed that. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Um, dear Excellencies, Rector, Professors, Distinguished Guests, Members of Staff, Fellow Students, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome everyone seated here in this auditorium this afternoon, most especially the new batch of 216 to 18 UNESCO IHG participants. I welcome you all to the largest global water institute where the world studies about water. Today marks the start of a journey that will change, shape, hone, and is going to enhance your skills on views not just about water, but the people the culture, the continent, and the beauty in our different diversities of culture. To most of us, there is a world of unanswered questions like, can I adapt to the Dutch education, the culture, the food, and the weather? There are questions. Yes, yes. You know, I tell my friends, I tell them, um, the Dutch order is like the mood of a pregnant woman because you don't know what's going to happen the next time. <laughs> so, okay. Um, there are questions about um, your colleagues from other parts of the world and what they are like. Um, the cultural diversity. At UNESCO, IHG is second to none. Just like we've had, we have participants from 61 countries. So, Delft, the city where UNESCO, IHG is located, is historical to the Netherlands. Um, issues like the old church and um, Delft Blue. Over time, maybe some of us have heard stories about that too. It has wonderful places to visit and um, have fun. Netherlands in general have a lot of places to visit and to make your stay worthwhile. Benjamin Franklin said, when the well is dry, we will know the water of water. We have all gathered here today for one singular purpose, water. Ismail Serral Gedeon rightly said that the wars of the 21st century will be fought over water. We are aware of the increasing regions under water stress, drought, water scarcity, lack of access to safe water and sanitation, water-related incidences like landslides, water conflicts between nations. There is need to offer solutions to these myriads of challenges. This is the reason why UNESCO IHG exists and why various governments and organizations have taken the pen to offer I and the new students here the opportunity to study in this great institution. So being in UNESCO IHG is simply a golden opportunity to get better in your skills as a water professional. You must not waste this opportunity. Here, you will learn how to solve water problems, innovating technical solutions, capacity building, best management practices, process optimization, better conflict resolution. I like the way the, uh, the guest speaker talked about um, migration and um, environments. She made a point that struck me, and that point is, it's not about um, that, that migration is like an adaptation. And one of the things I picked while being here is that you don't transfer technology, you look at how you can improve the one you have. You don't just, sometimes it doesn't work, like I come from Africa. It's not everything you pick from here that works exactly in Africa. So one of the things we're going to learn is, one, what exactly is workable where you're coming from, and what can you improve where you're coming from. 
there is need to proffer solutions to these myriads of challenges. This is the solution why this is the reason why IIT exists. So being at UNESCO IIT is, is simply a golden opportunity to get better in our skills. Here you will learn how to solve problems, innovating technical solutions, capacity building, and the rest. You must know that the opportunities in IHE are disguised as hard work. Most importantly, working hard smartly. The new students you understand by the time you go. Chiba Manda Ngozi Adichie is a Nigerian novelist and also she's acclaimed as a feminist. She said, most people think that what is obvious to them is obvious to others. A lot of our ideologies held about people from other parts of the world is going to change in the next 18 months. She stressed in one of her TED Talks how the media have used stories to dispossess, malign, oppress, oppress, break dignity of others. But in the same way, we can also use stories too, to repair. We can use stories to empower. We can also use stories to review. But the difference here is that you are not going to read those stories, but you are going to experience them here because as you relate with people from other parts of the world, you are going to really know that what you read is not exactly what it is. Here, you will learn to respect others, tolerate other people's ideas, views, even when you do not like them. This brings to an important issue, teamwork. An African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. You will have reasons to ask for your colleagues' inputs as you go through your studies, for their assistance and for their help. Do not look down on anyone, for no man is an island. Always remember that you are not a team because you work together, but you are a team because you respect each other. Always remember that none of us can be as smart as all of us. This will help you to excel academically. What we celebrate in UNESCO IHE is academic excellence. I have to still stress this again. What is celebrated here is academic excellence, no matter whatsoever you do. You must excel in this opportunity presented to you. Emerson said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. You need to create it yourself because I can tell you most times it will be missing. Because you will be presented with bends, never take them as the end of the road. It is time to bend down, bend low, work hard, because there is no shortcut to excellence. Lastly, you need to take out time to have fun outside academics. You can engage in soccer, volleyball, table tennis, other activities. We have quite a lot here. You will definitely need it because it is necessary to relieve stress. You will quite experience stress due to much work. Importantly, UNESCO IDT have the best lecturers that are open and available to answer your important questions. Always ask questions in class if you do not understand. Always remember to make an appointment if you need clarifications outside the classroom, as they have other tasks. Should you have any question or complaints outside academics, the Student Association Board and the Sociocultural Office are available to talk to. On behalf of the SAB, I want to wish you a blissful and a life-changing experience at UNESCO IHE and the Netherlands. God bless you all. I think we have an excellent uh, spokesperson for the Institute and also uh, giving you some uh, insights into the life uh, that is ahead of you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I would like to proceed with the, um, uh, the next step in our program and that is the uh, Alumni Award Ceremony. And for this purpose I would like to invite to the stage Maria Laura Sorrentino, our Alumni Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Here we are again with this uh, important award. Distinguished guests, alumni, 
colleagues, <coughs> students, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to congratulate all new students on the commencement of their studies at UNESCO IHE. Welcome to the Institute, welcome to DELP. Today is Alumni Day also, as it was mentioned before. And why? Well, simply question, because many professionals before you has started their studies at UNESCO IHE one October, like you today. UNESCO IHE has more than 15,000 alumni worldwide. They are the strongest network of professionals, <coughs> working professionals in the world. And we always say they are our best ambassadors and we are very, very proud of them. So for that reason, since the 55th anniversary of the Institute, it has been created this award to say thanks to all of them. And today we are going to celebrate the Alumni Award number four. It's an award that is given annually to an alumna or an alumnus who had had an illustrious career and has been a role model for other water professionals. So, the moment has arrived. I would like to invite to the podium the rector, Professor Fritz Holzman, and the business director, Johan van Dey, to nominate and to mention and to invite to the podium to the Alumni Award 2016. <coughs> Awards always have their own way of developing and uh, it, is, uh, it is always a challenge for all involved in such process. And uh, after a thorough discussion, we had at the end of the day a decision to award Professor Seifeldin Hamad Abdallah from Sudan as UNESCO IHE Alumni Award winner 2016. Nonetheless, there had been two other shortlisted, and I would like to mention that. It was a colleague from Mozambique, it was uh, Professor Alvaro Carmo Vaz, and it was a Professor Emeritus from the US, David Vasco. At the end of the day, we had to make a decision, and we decided that uh, Professor Seifeldin is the award winner of 2016. And there are good reasons. And let me say, Salam Saif. He is chairman of the Water Resources Technical Organ and he was a former minister of Water Resources of Sudan. He graduated from this institute 1983. So uh, look back, yes, some time passed. And after completing the hydraulic engineering program, and since then, he had a remarkable career. And I, you apologize, Saif, that I'm not uh, reading uh, the whole uh, CV, but I think I would like to highlight a few things. First of all, and this is, I think, uh, an important element for an engineer. He was heavily working in transboundary water management in a river basin which is still not a river basin where you can say all and everything fits properly together. It's a Nile basin. And um, I think Transboundary water management makes 
also clear that water can connect even if there are conflicts there. So this element was important when we, when we uh, said uh, you should get the award. Then said the water engineer at the Ministry of Water Resources in Sudan is, I would say, natural that somebody with this academic background. But I think important is that with his work in the ministry, he made a difference on the ground. He ensured that what the institute is proud of to make an impact, he really did. And in your whole career, I think it's also important to mention that you had been also for some time a minister for water resources in this country. I think you also did a major contribution to society. And this was your engagement in the hydrological program of UNESCO, but not just on the global level, also on the level of your country. And I think this is something what is also important to mention. In addition to that, you are a member of the board of the Sudan Engineers Union and the Sudan Engineering Council and the chair of the Arab Water Committee, what is quite important if it comes to water availability, to water management, and these things. And last but not least, <coughs> he went not simply back to his country doing a lot of things, he also learned here in the Institute, that what we are going to learn has to be multiplied and replicated. And uh, as professor in a number of universities, especially in the University of Khartoum, he is and was teaching a lot of young professionals they continued working afterwards in your country and had been enabled to manage water properly. You supervised Bachelor of Science students, Master students and PhDs. And I think this is also something where this institute is really proud of that you as a person uh, had been dedicated to this uh, way the institute was working. So please come on stage, safe. We would like to hand over the alumni award to you. And So now the floor is yours, safe. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. As Narah Marahi, UNESCO IGE Rector, Professor Rafriz, Ambassadors and Diplomatic Corps, UNESCO IGE staff. Members, PhD, MSC, senior and junior, and other enrolled students, distinguished 
brothers and sisters. It gives me great pleasure and honor to be here today among you on this historical day. At UNESCO IHE in the beautiful city of Delft. Respected brothers and sisters, at the outset of my speech, let me thank the NAFIC for providing the support for my studies in Delft and also send my sincere gratitude and honor to the current and former highly skilled and motivated staff of UNESCO IHE Delft who devoted <coughs> all their time and effort throughout the history of this institute. I also send my heartfelt condolences to all the families of the staff who passed away. Mention the former rector of the institute, Professor Mosterman and Professor Va Van der Veen and others who passed away. I would like also to extend my thanks to the Sudan Alamini chapter for their trust and confidence bestowed upon me and their nomination for this prestigious IHE Alamini Prize. This prize has become an international honor for three <coughs> reasons. The first one, for engineers, it recognizes their unwavering efforts, which lead to tremendous impacts on the livelihood of their people and regions and acknowledge them in the history of their countries. Number two, for water science and engineering, the prize inspires the young water engineers and scientists about the importance and value of what water science and engineering provide for their communities, their countries, and their regions, and for the humanity at large. This will culminate in better appreciation and support for their people and for their governments. Number three, the UNESCO IHG is one of the best recognized <coughs> and the largest international graduate water facility in the world. Over 15,000 water professionals from, from 160 countries were educated at the institute and 95% of them returned to their home country. Now the institution has the largest global network of water professionals in the world. All graduates are skilled professionals engaged in a broad range of disciplines related to water have the capacity for independent thinking, equipped with, with knowledge, 
skills and competences and have a life-changing experience to perform their, their function anywhere in the world. Furthermore, their academic quality is excellent and internationally reputed and recognized. I salute them from here and wish them a prosperous life. The three reasons are noble and have impact on people and all sectors of society at large. The inspiration on young engineers will culminate in exerting more and formidable efforts to gain the science, engineering, and knowledge on water, which is related to their people and societies and to their country conditions. It will also require a huge effort to apply and disseminate what they have learned to their communities in their developing countries and secure that they enjoy the benefits of basic services. Distinguished brothers and sisters, water is life. It belongs to everyone. And I remember in 2013 in the Stockholm Water Week, International Water Week, all the scientists and engineers agreed that water is a connector, it is not a sector. It has no owner, no border, and it, it touches the lives and the life and the livelihood of everyone. Poor or rich, everywhere. Hence, water science and engineering is vital to our lives and well-being and for the needs of the present and future generations. It is also vital for our, our peace and security, especially in developing countries. It is also vital the global challenge today is to convert water from a vehicle of conflict to a, an avenue of cooperation. I believe that the UNESCO IHE with its high capacity in demand driven independent research will contribute to the knowledge of water and development with, em with emphasis on transboundary water issues. Distinguished brothers and sisters, on my personal life, including my family, please identify yourself, my wife, Amina, would you stand up? <laughs> My elder son, Tariq, who was six months old when he was here. Can you stop now? Yes. <laughs> and my daughter, Sarah, and her husband, Ahmed. My daughter, Sarah, is a senior MSC, and husband, Ahmed, is a young MSC student a junior MSc student here, and also <coughs> Dr. Muhammad, who is now in Washington, D.C., and engineer Abu Bakr, who was here and left just a couple of days ago for an emergency commitment. The recognized prize is a landmark in my life and 
energizer for more water sense acquisition and the application of endeavors towards my people, my community, my country, and my region. I love my career as a water engineer and have the desire, the ability, and responsibility to, to be lifelong to be lifelong learner in an ever-changing world. The enabling environment we have had at this institute helped us to develop an intellectual, professional, lifelong learning and personal experience. After that, I stayed connected with IHA from 19 83 to date as part of the alumni community, distinguished brothers and sisters. At this juncture, I would like to thank all brothers and sisters who contributed to my career and also who were part of my achievements and success. <coughs> this is in particular my brothers and sisters in the Ministry of Water in Sudan, with whom I spent most of my life. They too must be proud of their contribution to this recognition and to their societies. Personally, I am privileged to have knowledge and experience from different local, regional, and international academic and professional institutions, starting from the University of Khartoum in Sudan, IHE, Delft here in Netherlands, Water Resource Research and Documentation Center in Italy, the Hydraulics research in Wallingford, England, and Utah State University in the USA for my PhD, and the great field and research experience also I've, I have got from my ministry and the Nile Basin institutions. However, the Delft experience has had the most unique impact on my life. And on my career, I, and, and I expect it to be the major in my future endeavor. I am glad that the recognition and alumni prize and the honor I have received today came at the right time when I am still working and contributing to my people and the society in, in Sudan and to my region. It is an inspiration to exert more time, huge and formidable effort and dedication. My passion of water science and engineering and learning is unlimited and is unconfined. Distinguished brothers and sisters, I am also glad to have my daughter Sarah. Please also identify yourself again. I am very proud of you. <laughs> Can you just stand up? <laughs> now, a senior MSC student in Delft, and is the only child in my small family 
following my steps in, in this regard. Furthermore, my son in law, Engineer Ahmed, the husband of Sarah, my, my daughter Sarah, please also again, <laughs> is a new MCC in Delft who is following the same track. I tell them that you are very lucky to be here in this institution, internationally distinguished institute. I wish them a successful future career and endeavor in the field of water. Distinguished brothers and sisters, now with your recognition and the alumni prize, I feel that a new commitment, responsibility, and, as, and associated future challenges are on my shoulder. I ask Allah, the God, to pave the road for me to move forward with more energy and blood in my veins for new future achievements. I should not feel satisfied with what I have achieved so far. Satisfaction should come from our societies and not never come from ourselves. With this expression, I conclude my speech and thank you all, distinguished brothers and sisters, for this great ceremony and great day. My sincere thanks go to the UNESCO IHE Rector, Professor Fritz, and staff, and to Maria, Laura, where is Maria? Maria. <laughs> okay, there. <laughs> and the Alamini relations officers and to Professor Kenneth and all staff behind the scenes who worked hard to achieve this great day. God bless your endeavor and thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Seif Heldin. I think I put it in one sentence. You really demonstrated that water can be not simply understood as a job. Water needs passion, and you expressed your passion for this subject in an excellent way. The new students, but all of us, can take part in the experiences uh, and the journey of uh, Professor Seifeldin tomorrow. He will have a lunch seminar here in the Institute on 1245 in A3, and uh, he will take you to the Nile Basin and will go on a journey with you about the challenges, the opportunities, and the lessons learned. Everybody is invited uh, to this lunch seminar tomorrow. Now it's my pleasure and my honor to declare the academic year 2016 opened. And uh, it's a great pleasure that I can all invite you to a reception downstairs and that the ambassadors can find the students from their countries downstairs. Just upstairs. Here, okay, upstairs, good. Uh, we have placed flags on the table 
though you can easily find the students and you can tie up with them. So thank you very much for coming and I wish you a nice remaining evening.